Welcome to the Situation Report today. Very glad to have you joining me for this fantastic conversation. This is the show where we do our best three times a week to bring you the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. My name is Jeremy Stallnecker. I am your host and very glad to have you uh, joining me for a conversation with Jenna Ellis. Jenna is of course, on the Salem Podcast Network. If you're following this show, perhaps you have listened to her show as well. But I'm very grateful for the opportunity to spend a few minutes interviewing her. Uh, I actually asked her to come on so that we could talk about the Trump administration and some of the things that are happening there. But you'll notice as we get into this interview, we spend a lot of time talking about faith and the role of faith and why it's important um, as a person of faith to express that in the public square. And she does such a great job of articulating that. I want to encourage you, <laughs> and I want you to be encouraged as you hear this conversation. If you are a person of faith, if you're one who would say privately, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that the gospel is important, that His Word is what guides my life, if you would say that privately, live that out publicly, because really that is the answer for our country, is that those of us who hold to the truth— the truth that comes from God, we hold to the truth. The future of our country uh, really in so many ways will be defined by whether or not we who hold the truth live that truth out publicly. And Jenna, as you'll hear in this conversation, articulates that so well. And I'm very grateful that she would come on, spend a few minutes with us today. And I trust that you will enjoy this conversation with my guest, Jenna Ellis. She needs probably no introduction to our audience, but I'll give you one anyhow. Jenna is the host of The Jenna Ellis Show on Salem Media, a contributor for Newsmax and many other news outlets, special counsel for the Thomas More Society, and former legal uh, senior legal counsel to President Donald Trump. Jenna, thank you so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jeremy. And the newest title that we can add to that as well is Senior Legal Advisor for Doug Mastriano running for governor out of Pennsylvania. That is the most important race in the country. And I'm so proud and honored to join his team. So with all of the things that you do, adding titles all of the time, how do you have time to do an interview like this? That's the only question I have. Well, because this is so important and uh, I love Salem Media and, you know, I actually love uh, going anywhere that I can to speak truth and to break down not just political topics and what's going on in the world, but always bringing it back to uh, the biblical Christian worldview, yeah. which is the best explanation for the reality that, to which we're presented. So that's what I talk about on my show every day and yeah. always happy to go anywhere, meet new friends like you and to speak truth. That's awesome. Well, let's let's start with your story, if we can, because I would love for you to break down um, your background, maybe not everything, perhaps, but how you got into the political world. And I would love to also hear your faith story and how the two of those intersect for you. Yeah, and they're actually very inextricably intertwined. And, um, you know, it, it would take hours to tell everything that God has done uh, in my life and for me. But uh, the highlights and I guess the kind of elevator version, if you will, mm. is that um, I was homeschooled all the way through and my parents yeah. gave me such a, a solid foundation in the Christian worldview. And that actually helped me understand that God's calling on my life when I was age 14 was to become a lawyer because I wow. really uh, wanted to make a difference in the world of law and in the courtroom and to be an advocate for truth. And so uh, when I went to law school, um, of course, after graduating homeschool, uh, going through uh, journalism was my undergrad. It helped me write quickly and well on a deadline. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah, but yeah. I went to law school and was confronted with uh, the way that we teach law students, which is that law is completely arbitrary and whatever the sovereign or the tyrant uh, in any given nation is at any particular moment, then that's the definition of what morality is in that mm. particular nation. And that didn't sit very well with me as a Christian because we understand that morality is uh, absolute and we understand that there is a measurable difference between right and wrong and good and evil. And like we're seeing right now with the uh, forthcoming Dobbs case, that um, you know, abortion is morally wrong. And that was true pre-1973, and that's going to be true after Roe. And I'm very excited we can yeah. say after Roe. But um, our future advocates, especially in the realm of law and also extended into policy and politics, 
have to understand that what we're arguing for is ultimately the truth and it's objective. And there is a measurable difference between right and wrong and good and evil. And so we don't just have these arbitrary moral standards that our Congress or our governor can just, you know, get in a room and decide what is ultimately right and good and true for society, but we are under a legitimate authority. And so as our founders said so eloquently in the Declaration of Independence, that they recognize that truth is self-evident, that all men are created equal, they're endowed by God our creator with certain rights. And among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And they obligated our government mm. for the first time in world history that we have to protect and preserve the rights that are God-given. And so our rights are pre-political. And so with that understanding and finally reconciling this uh, way that law is taught that's actually right. very wrong right. with my Christian faith, um, I ended up writing a book in 2015 that's called The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution. And it's my defense of the Christian worldview being at the heart and soul and foundation of America. And through that book, um, I ultimately got a lot of opportunities to go yeah. on media to expound on this more. And Jeremy, I'll tell you, you never know who's watching uh, hmm. because... A couple of years later, I get a phone call from a 202 number <laughs> right. that I recognized as DCM, a Colorado girl, 303. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon, so I just let it go to voicemail, and I thought, yeah, it's a sales call. Thankfully, I listened to the voicemail because it said, hi, Miss <laughs> Ellis, this is the White House operator. The yeah. president's reaching out to you. Could you please give us a call back at your earliest Yeah, wow, well, wow. Well. And I thought, what the heck? This is not actually for me. But lo and behold, it was President Trump, and my life completely changed after that. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've been to the men's department lately, but men are being held hostage by overpriced brands that simply aren't mission tested. That's why we're excited to tell you about Undertack, the only brand that's literally been battle tested by special forces. These have to be the greatest boxers ever made because they cover all the bases. High quality material that's antibacterial, anti-pilling, and moisture wicking so you stay fresh and dry all day. A quick release fly in a secret pocket in the extra wide waistband for cash or tactical necessities. Undertack is durable, ultra light, fade resistant, and shrink resistant. And here's the best part. They're almost 30% less than the competition. Go to getundertack.com. That's getundertack.com right now. Save 20% off your order with the offer code SITREP20. All one word, SITREP20. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. This is a great American company that's unapologetically pro-America, pro-Second Amendment, and pro-military. That's getundertack.com, getundertack.com, offer code SITREP20. Man, a lot of questions I want to ask and follow up. I'll say this, or ask this, I guess. I have a 22-year-old daughter who aspires to be a, an attorney. She's a Christian. She was raised in our home. And you, Jenna Ellis, have been one of the people that we've talked about often as an example of someone who you know, is a conservative, is a Christian. Uh, my daughter homeschooled for a lot of years. Um, not that all of those things have to align, but you provide an example or a roadmap, a path for people like my daughter. And I would imagine many others. Is that something that you think about when you're doing this? Or is it, I'm going to do the job and hopefully someone else is watching? You know, um, there is, that's a dual fold question. And I think both are very important because ultimately my only audience is my Lord and Savior, Jesus mm, Christ. And no matter what we're doing in any profession or vocation, we should be doing all things to the furtherance of the gospel. Yep. And of course, to uh, fulfill the Great Commission. And that's why our first liberties in America are so important to protect because without the freedom of speech, freedom of association, free exercise of religion, we couldn't be doing what we're doing right, right now, which is right. speaking together about truth. Yeah, that's right. So of course, what I'm doing is ultimately to protect the ability of all Americans, and um, it should be every human being that's ever existed to pursue the truth of God. And I am very aware, though, on the other side of it, that people are watching. And I'm certainly not a perfect example, but I think that my life is an example and a testament to the grace of God. And yeah, if he can good. use me, he can use anyone. So I'm very aware of that. And I'm grateful for um, people like your daughter and um, like so many others that I've uh, taught, you know, whether it's Colorado Christian University or other, um, other places like Turning Point USA that yeah. I get to interact with yeah. students who are encouraged that they can have a platform for Christ. Um, maybe like mine, maybe it looks something totally different 
but that they can speak the truth of God in any vocation. And I hope that I'm serving as an example to point people to Christ and say, this needs to be bigger than just doing your job, bigger than who we elect as president, bigger than anything else, is that ultimately we're winning hearts and souls for Christ. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned this, and, and I'd like to ask you a question. I wrote a blog the, this last this week for Father's Day. Um, really encouraging fathers. Here are some things you need to teach your kids. The world is uncertain. The future certainly is not clear. But there are some things you need to invest in your kids. You need to teach them that the most important relationship in their life is a relationship with God. You need to teach them about the importance of the local church, and we need to be a part of the local church. You need to help them understand what it is to have a biblical worldview and how to live principally in line with that biblical worldview. The last point I put on there was you need to teach your kids how to understand the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not for the protections guaranteed in the Constitution, it's going to be very difficult to do the others. Now, we need to teach our kids to do the others as well, even if we don't have legal protection. But the Constitution, in, in, in my view, it's not equal with Scripture. It's not the Bible, but it is a God-ordained document that has allowed religious freedom and expression to take place around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world. Why do you think it is, and, and this is something that is very, very frustrating to me as a Christian, as a former pastor, as someone who cares about these things, why is it that so many Christian people, people who should understand this, are, are allowing the, the divide between what they believe politically or culturally, nationally, and the Bible to widen. This, this, this divide is widening, and it's, it's nuts to me, because if anyone should value uh, the liberty that we have ensconced in the Constitution, proclaimed in the Declaration, it should be Christians, and yet we seem to be losing that. What's driving that in, from, from your position? I think it's the failure of the church to teach sound theology. And we have so many churches that are so hesitant to engage in what they think are just political topics. Yep. And they view uh, what their role is in the Christian's life and in the family's life as just being kind of a glorified Jesus TED talk. Like Jesus yeah. is your life yeah. coach and let's yeah. go out and <laughs> right. live your best life rather right. than explaining that the Christian worldview is comprehensive. It is if we understand that God ordained the truth of reality and everything that he has done from the beginning. I mean, Genesis 1-1 is yep. the most important verse of the Bible. Yep. In the beginning, God. Yep. And if we understand that, then we understand that everything that we do, our humanity, all of these issues that we have to face in culture, in our lives, in politics, in family, in education, in any sort of sphere, has to be either truthfully based or something else, which is not truth. And so I think there's this separation in this divide because we're looking just to add on Jesus to an already secular worldview yeah, premise. Right. And we can't do that. We have to completely reorient our thinking to truth. And truth is defined, as you know, Jeremy, as the person of Jesus Christ. And the more that we grow in the grace and knowledge of truth and we know who Jesus is and we know why his grand narrative explains our reality. We all have to answer life's most important questions. Who are we? What defines a human? Where are we going? Mm. What's the purpose of life? Um, all of these things have to be answered either truthfully or with something else. Yeah. And so for the Christian, if we understand in the beginning God, yeah. then everything else flows from that. And Jesus isn't just an add-on. He's at the heart and soul of everything that we are and yeah. live and do as human beings in every aspect. You said that you were raised in a Christian home and you were taught Christian truth principles growing up. Um, was there a, a point in your life where you made that your own, where you said, this is what I'm going to live out? Not, not in, a, in a salvation sense, um, but I'm going to live out the principles of of what I believe as a Christian. Absolutely, and I was very fortunate to grow up in a Christian home and to have uh, mentorship from both of my parents. Yeah. But of course, when you become an adult, uh, then you have to make decisions for yourself. Am I going to continue right. on in just what my parents taught me or am I going to own this for myself? And I think for me, the most critical uh, stage initially was going through law school and being confronted with a very secular mm. perspective of law and this kind of social contract theory that's really based on a secular humanist perspective yeah. to yep. say that we can just arbitrate our own reality. And it's that man is creating God in our own image instead of recognizing the truth that God created man in his image. Yep. 
and that morality only comes from him. And so I had to confront these issues and decide, do I really believe in the truth of the Bible and what God says, or am I going to believe something different? And every person, and, and there have been many moments along the way, I mean, breakups that I've had or you know, situations that have been difficult that I've had to ask myself that question. Do I really believe yeah. what I say I believe? And yeah. that's all Hebrews 11, the, the, the hall of faith. It's all about people who believed in the promises of God and acted on those promises. That's the definition of faith. Yeah. And so my faith has grown the more that I believe in the promises of God and I'm willing to act on them. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that phrase. Uh, faith is uh, taking God at his word and living your life according to it, which is what you just said. I don't know who yes. coined that phrase, but... But that's exactly what it is. And I think so many people are confused about faith. It's a mystical thing out there. I just need to wish hard enough or believe hard enough or hope hard enough. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's it's a response to God's word. I, I would imagine that you've had points, particularly as you've entered into politics, where that has been tried and tested. How have you navigated that so that now you're continuing to be who you are? You haven't lost yourself in that process. Uh, what, what have been some of the the tools that you've used or some of the things that you've held on to that have helped you to navigate those points along the way. You were, you were in politics and have been in politics at a very tumultuous time in the world. Um, so I can imagine it's been difficult. What have you held on to along the way? Yeah, it is difficult and you know, ongoing, it's still difficult. I mean, my home state of Colorado where I'm bar licensed is actively uh, seeking to disbar me and take away you know, my livelihood as an attorney. Um, I've yeah. had so many attacks and personal threats um, just for representing President Trump. I mean, these things have been um, you know, at a very high and very national and very public yeah. level as well. Yeah. And you know, those aren't easy things to navigate, but at the same time that has made my faith stronger. And you're right, faith isn't just something we believe in like Joe Biden believes in the Easter Bunny, right? <laughs> you know, it's led around at sure. the, on the White House lawn. Um, it's understanding that ultimately, do I fear the consequences that man can impose for my faith? Or do I fear God first and do I care only yeah about seeking truth and living my life to proclaim the truth. Yeah. And when I've continued to recognize and through a lot of trials and a lot of prayer and, and a lot of mentorship from my parents and pastors around the country who pray for me, who disciple me, um, what I have realized is that I can face anything because ultimately none of that matters. If they end up disbarring me, and I hope they don't, but if yeah. they end up doing that, well, so what does that change the truth of who I am and my inherent dignity and worth as a Christian? Well, no. And would I change anything? Absolutely not. And that's the fear of God instead of the fear of man. And so we can have courage in the faith of absolute overt hostility and death threats, which I experienced in the post 2020 election. If we say, ultimately, God has me, I know where I'm spending eternity, I know what the truth is. And so I don't care what man may do to me. I serve God and God alone. Then ultimately, like uh, John 3.18 says, if the son shall set you free, you are free indeed. And right. I am the most free and bold in my faith than I've ever been in my life, yeah. literally thanks to the leftists. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Um, man, what an incredible perspective. And to see someone live that out, it's one thing to talk about that in a, a Christian world if you are surrounded only by Christians and perhaps you're in a ministry position or something like that. But to see that played out in the world, which I think is the idea of biblical Christianity, right? It's it's Jesus yes. Christ sending out his disciples into the world to spread the gospel. I mean, that's that's what it's supposed to look like. And to see that is uh, it's an incredible encouragement. Pivoting from that, uh, you got that call. I took us on a long rabbit trail. You got that call from uh, the, the switchboard operator at the White House and said the president would like to contact you or talk to you. Um, and that started a series of events that led to how most of us would, would know you. Um, how would you characterize your time in the Trump administration? Um, obviously, President Trump has never lost his ability to be out in front of people. And now with the, the, the trial or hearing or witch hunts or whatever's happening Shame right service, now, yeah. yeah, whatever's going on right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of back in front of all of us again. Um, from, from your seat, from your perspective, and you had so many insights there, how would you describe your time working with him and for him? You know, it was the greatest honor of um, my lifetime and my career wow. to have a front row seat to 
the American presidency, you know, and as someone who has loved the U.S. Constitution for all of the reasons that we've described, and I'm so proud to be an American because this is the greatest country on the face of the earth because we were founded to recognize truth, uh, to be able to then serve uh, the greatest president of my lifetime um, was such an honor. And I absolutely love President Trump. Um, and, and he's such a wonderful person. And, mm. you know, we could talk about all of the things that he does publicly, but I love talking about who he is privately as well, because, um, you know, some of my most cherished memories are the things that were behind the scenes and, you know, who he is off camera. It's it's actually the same exact person that he is on camera. Mm. He's just, he's the kindest, funniest um, person who just has such a big heart. And one of my favorite stories is the first year I was working for him, um, I was invited to the White House Christmas party, and you know, of course, pre-COVID and everything. Um, so back in the day, before we yeah. had to worry <laughs> back about that. Back in the day, right? Um, yeah, and so he had asked me, like, maybe a week in advance. He goes, you know, Jenna, do you have somebody coming with you? Like, you know, do you have a date? And I was like, why are like, you know, you're going to set me up with somebody? And so, well, I just want to make sure you're you're not coming alone. I said, yeah, my dad's actually flying from Colorado, and he's really excited. He's only been on the regular tour, and he's like, okay, well, that's good. And you know, I thought nothing of that. And when we get there. The White House social secretary greeted us and said, the president has asked to meet your father. And oh, wow. we were escorted down to the diplomatic wow. room. Nobody else was there. The president comes in and, you know, he shakes my dad's hand, grips his shoulder. And he says, uh, Dave, so great to meet you. And I just had to tell you from one father to another that I am so proud of your daughter. Oh, incredible. And that those types of moments, I mean, President Trump just loves people. He loves Americans. He has he loves family. And that's what it's all about. And I really wish that all of these people calling him such mean, nasty things, um, if they only knew how false that was. And right. I can say from personal experience, and I still have the privilege of talking to him frequently, um, he is literally one of the most wonderful people I've ever had the opportunity yeah. to call my friend. As you know, our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by simply creating the best pillow. Now Mike has done it again by introducing his My Slippers. For a limited time, you will save $90 on a pair of My Slippers. This blowout sale of the year won't last, so order now. Mike has taken two years to develop the My Slippers, and they are designed to wear both indoor and out all day long. Made with my pillow foam and impact gel to help prevent fatigue, they are also made with quality leather suede. Call 1-800-870-0283, use the promo code SITREP, or go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener square, and use promo code SITREP. This offer will not last long, so order now with promo code SITREP at MyPillow.com. Well, it's incredible to hear you say that, and I have been a supporter of President Trump, and um, very thankful for him and for his administration. But there are so many people that would have the complete opposite belief about him that you just described. And it's, it's crazy because anyone I have known that has spent time with him has said something very similar to what you've said and even the personal interactions and the personal moments. What do you make of the, the January 6th hearings that are taking place right now? It's, it's obviously a ploy to undermine a potential uh, next run of the president. But what, how would you characterize what's taking place right now? It's just the next line in a long, systematic approach by the Democrats to hate President Trump and try to get him disqualified from office. And we saw what they did starting in 2015, you know, with Spygate, all of these things. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then go, moving forward into impeachment hoax one and you know, the Mueller report and then the second. All of these things have been designed for one purpose, not to find the truth or to find facts but to disqualify President Trump because they know that they can't run against him yeah. and actually win on fair grounds. And so what they're trying to do with harnessing this term insurrection and falsely applying that to January 6th is trying to actually bastardize and manipulate the term, the legal term in the 14th Amendment, which historically we need to understand in perspective was part of the Reconstruction Amendments after the Civil mm, War yep. to say that if you were in an elected position and then participated in an insurrection against the United States, like literally fought against this country for a foreign entity like the Confederacy, which declared themselves separate from America, then at that point, you could no longer hold office. And that makes sense. But to characterize wanting to protect 
the integrity of an election, challenge election results, go through the process that's defined in the Electoral Count Act as somehow participating in an insurrection, it's laughable. Yeah. But even more than yeah. that, it's absolutely wicked and it's evil. And these people are exactly what the Constitution defines as domestic enemies because mm. they are trying on purpose to manipulate American elections and American office holders all across the country for no good reason other than their their political opposition. Um, these folks who are overseeing this right now to destroy the president and his ability to run in the future are the same people that for the last couple of years have very actively undermined the most important institutions in the United States. And I mean, we can talk about the home. I, you know, I, I tend to look at institutions from a biblical perspective in that three institutions given to us by God. We have the home, the church, and local government. And they have, that is the left, has actively worked to destroy all three. And I think there's a much larger agenda there. I think there's a spiritual agenda yes. as well. Um, do you think we can ever get back to a place? And, and, and again, I, I, I don't know President Trump, but my perception of him is that he was trying to bring us to a place where we valued what it is to be an American again and the home and and all these things we've long held as important. Can we get back to that place again or have we crossed a line where where it will never be the same? We absolutely can, because there's always hope in the truth of Christ. And what we need to be doing is not just looking as Americans for government on a federal or even local level to be our savior. And what we've done over the last 50 and 60 years has abdicated so much of the responsibility of the family of parents in raising their children and in education yeah. to the state. We've abdicated what it means to be the church and civil society. We've taken on this false narrative of separation of church right, and state and right. said, we can't talk about politics. We've abdicated the church's role and responsibility in the Christian life to the state. And so instead of just looking to the state, to be the savior, we need to be the cultural warriors in the church and in the home and start taking responsibility as parents and as individuals in the church and church leaders to actually fulfill the responsibilities yeah. of those institutions. And I think if we can bring those institutions back to America, then absolutely we can change our government. Because as Andrew Breitbart very famously said, politics is downstream from culture. Right. But I've kind of added on to that to say that culture is downstream from worldview. And if we can have the correct worldview in the right. home and Agreed. in the church, that absolutely will affect politics. Yeah, that's good. And we need then parents to stand up and begin leading again and leading their homes and, and you know, pastors and churches and others who understand what it is to have an appropriate biblical worldview. Very, very important. Um, yes. You said that your new title is your most important title at the moment. You're working for uh, the campaign of, of uh, Doug Mastriano. Can you talk about that a little bit and why um, you would say that's the most important campaign taking place right now? Absolutely. Well, as we're coming up in November and the midterm elections are incredibly important in order to get back to protecting parental rights, uh, protecting religious freedom so that the government uh, doesn't go contrary to the First Amendment, which is to protect religious freedom, not just allowing churches or protecting their right to speak as the church, but also not doing what the left is trying to do with this whole Pride Month, right? Which is to yeah. compel Christians to affirm yeah. a lie yeah. and affirm things that go contrary to our sincerely held religious right. beliefs. And so uh, all of these things are incredibly important. Election integrity is also incredibly important. And Doug Mastriano not only is a sincere Christian, but he is also a veteran of the United States military. And he also um, has been a senator uh, since uh, you know, for the last two years, since 2019, uh, with the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Mm. He was the one that organized the Gettysburg hearing that was then the impetus for three other states in the aftermath of the 2020 yeah. election to actually hear from witnesses and hear from people on the ground with evidence of what they saw in the post-election uh, uh, just debacle. And so in Pennsylvania, which is the keystone state, if we elect Doug Mastriano, I know that his leadership and his appointments, like the ability of the governor in Pennsylvania to appoint a secretary of state who will administer elections according to state law, which is what the Constitution requires, right. that will be the shining light and the example for the rest of the country and will influence the other swing states to not only preserve the sanctity of the ballot, but also to make sure that we keep a government in its proper role, which is limited. 
Yeah, limited right, powers right. to protect and preserve our rights. And right. I truly believe that under a Mastriano administration, then Ron DeSantis is going to look like amateur hour, but the rest of the country is going to be looking to Pennsylvania and saying, wow, we need to get back to being the ground zero of freedom and liberty, uh, like what happened in 1787. Yeah, that's good. Um, everyone right now is looking to the midterm elections. Um, I, I have a fear wrapped up in the midterms that I'll share with you now that the Republicans will regain control of the House and the Senate, and they'll do absolutely nothing with it, which will lead us into the uh, presidential election in 24 and set us back instead of carrying us forward. Um, how, do you, how do you view not only the midterms, but what will happen beyond that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that we can't look to Washington to solve its own problems. Yeah. And I have really no faith in a Republican majority of Congress to do absolutely anything. Um, I call the trifecta up there the McMorons, which is Ronna McDaniel, <laughs> uh, Kevin McCarthy and uh, Mitch McConnell. Right. They're the McMorons yeah, and sure. they are not interested in doing anything remotely related to conservatism. They're only interested in protecting their own power. But this is exactly why the state and local elections right. matter even yep. more because yep. with governor's races, with secretaries of state races, with school board races, with, with all of these things, we're actually get, getting back to the principle of federalism that Washington shouldn't matter. I mean, if, if the Republicans accomplish nothing in Washington, that's fine by me. Yeah. I'd rather have a state and local government that is doing what it should, like a Doug Mastriano administration yep. in Pennsylvania, like a Greg Lopez administration in my home state of Colorado, uh, like a Ron DeSantis administration in the free state of Florida. That's good. Um, Jenna, you do a lot of work. You're all over the place. Your podcast is daily, which is crazy. As someone who does a podcast three times a week, adding two more would just be overwhelming to me. I'm not sure I could handle it, but you do a daily podcast. Uh, where can people follow you and and not only hear your podcast daily, but the other work that you're involved in. Yeah, thank you. You can follow me across all social media, including you know Twitter, Truth Social, Getter, Facebook, everything at Jenna Ellis ESQ. I'm still a licensed attorney. Be praying for that, please. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also find me at the Jenna Ellis Show. Dot com, and you can also subscribe to uh, the Rumble channel. We're still on YouTube. Great. And uh, of course, you can follow me uh, also on Newsmax as well. And um, I'm on there quite frequently. Awesome. Jenna Ellis, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Another fantastic conversation. Very grateful for Jenna's time. And uh, it's, it's interesting hearing her perspective on President Trump, of course, and her view of what's happening politically in the world. But honestly, for me, the most encouraging part of the entire conversation, uh, the entire interview was hearing her describe her faith and how important that is to her and how she lives that out in um, all that she's doing uh, politically in her career, living out her faith and just how critical that is. I hope that was an encouragement to you. It should be. If you are a person of faith, it certainly should be. If you're not one who would describe yourself as a person of faith, but you are a conservative in that you believe in conservative values and principles and you believe in our founding documents as they direct who we are as Americans, then you should be encouraged by that as well. Because the ability to live out what we believe personally in a very public way really is at the core, the essence of what it means to be an American. And we need more folks like Jenna who understand there is a higher purpose and a higher calling, and she's going to live that out. Very, very grateful for her and her testimony and her willingness to talk through that with us. I hope, again, uh, that was helpful to you. If you are not yet subscribed to this show, make sure that you do subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You're listening right now somewhere, whatever that is uh, that you're listening from, go ahead and subscribe there and then go over to our YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube, search for The Situation Report. You'll find our channel. So do two things, subscribe, then hit the notification bell. From there, you can leave us a comment. You can share that content out and uh, we'd love to communicate with you there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you next time. Many of you know that my day job is working for an organization called the Mighty Oaks Foundation. I've had the opportunity to work with the Mighty Oaks Foundation for a little over 10 years now and very grateful for that opportunity. 
I served in the United States Marine Corps and left in 2003. When I came back from Iraq and got out of the Marine Corps, I transitioned and had some of the same struggles that many of our veterans today have. Uh, that transition time can be very, very difficult. I moved on with the help and support of my family and others in my close-knit community and really in many ways tried to walk away from my service. It was too hard, too difficult for me to look back, to remember, to stay connected, and so I chose not to. About 10 years after I walked away, I was reconnected with many of the men that I had served with uh, in Iraq and even before that Iraq deployment and came to understand that so many of the men that I served with did not do well. I came home and I struggled, but I had a family around me and I had a community around me that helped me to get back on my feet and continue moving forward. So many of those that I had served with, however, did not have the same opportunity. They came home and didn't have that family around them, that community that could lift them up. And so they made some decisions, decisions that we talk about often in the veteran community. I was reminded about 10 years after my service that some of the men that I served with in Iraq came home and struggled and decided that it would be best for them to end their lives. Others who had not taken their lives, but who had struggled from one relationship to the next, from one job to another, and had never really gotten back on their feet. I learned after 10 years that walking away from my military service was not really an option. <laughs> you see, we think we can hang our uniform in the closet for the last time and walk away, but our obligation to those that we served with remains. It was at that time that I had the opportunity to get connected to the Mighty Oaks Foundation. It was just getting started. I met our founder, Chad Robichaux. And together we began to work on what is today a national nonprofit serving veterans, active duty service members, and more and more the first responders in our community. That's what we do. You see, Chad served in the Marine Corps as well, and both of us have an understanding, and so many of the folks, many, many folks that work with us now who served in the military and in the first responder community understand that we may get out, we may hang the uniform up, but we still have an obligation to care for those who have served or are serving. That's exactly what we do at the Mighty Oaks Foundation every single day. We run programs across the country for those who have served, veterans, or are serving, active duty service members, those who are serving in their community as first responders, police officers and firefighters, and others in that first responder community. We serve them by helping them to understand that there is life beyond their service, that their identity should be wrapped up in more than a uniform or a job that they've done or are doing, that there is a purpose, that there is a plan. In fact, that God the Creator has something He intends for them, and that if they'll simply align their lives to the life that He has for them, so much of the trauma, so much of the difficulty, so much of their past, so many of those things that have a hold on them, they may not go away, but they won't maintain the hold and the control. Here's the message we try to convey and communicate. There is hope, and there is a community of people found within the Mighty Oaks Foundation that understand where you've been because we've been there. We don't have it all figured out. We're certainly not perfect, but we've taken some steps to move forward and we want to take you with us. That's what we do. How do we do that? Again, by communicating the fact that there is hope, by connecting with others who've been there and know how to move forward and by getting around you and supporting you as you begin to take those very important steps yourself. The Mighty Oaks Foundation is blessed to have supporters across the country that make it possible for us to do the work that we do at no cost to the veteran, the active duty service member, or the first responder. For you to attend our program, you simply need to set aside five days and come to one of our locations, one of our facilities. We'll do the rest. There will be no cost to you for the program, no cost for the transportation to get you to the program. We do all of the planning and all of the logistics. You simply need to get there. We want to remove every obstacle for you to get the help, the encouragement, the strengthening, <laughs> the hope, the renewal that you need. We're thankful for the opportunity to do that. Perhaps you are not a veteran or a service member. You're not in the first responder community, but you care about those who have served and are serving our communities. Well, you may fall into the other category then. Perhaps you're someone that can support what we do financially to make it possible for those folks to come along. 
Maybe your support is not financial support, but you know someone in your community, in your town, in your church, uh, in a club or something else that you're a part of that could use this kind of support and encouragement. Plug them in. Let us help them. Let us get them on the road. No cost to them. We want to do the work, but we need you to get them to us. That was a lot of words. If you listen to the show, you know I say a lot of words sometimes. So let me point you to the one place where you can get all your questions answered. MightyOaksPrograms.org is our website. MightyOaksPrograms.org. There you will find more information about what we do as an organization. There's an application for those who would like to apply. Fill that out, application out. Our team will get back to you, set everything else up. If you would like to support the work of the Mighty Oaks Foundation, you'll find a place to do that there as well. And there is also a section for resources. So many of you know people who need help but may not start by coming to a program, attending a program, but they would read a book, they would watch a video, they would listen to a testimony. We have those resources there for you as well. So please come and join us at the Mighty Oaks Foundation Foundation's website, mightyoaksprograms.org. Our veterans, active duty members, and first responders need our support. Maybe you're in that category. You need our support. And that begins by going to the Mighty Oaks Programs website, mightyoaksprograms.org.